So music has the power to connect people, and it has been encouraging to see how music has been a part not only of student learning, but also community building within CPI. So I'm privileged to introduce Kerry Bosma, the Initiative Director of Operations, and Todd Chaffee, Calvin Professor and CPI Director. Through their leadership, dedication, and care, the Calvin Prison Initiative, which is an initiative of both Calvin University and Calvin Theological Seminary, has grown since its inception in 2015 and serves as a model for higher education in prisons, not just in Michigan, but in the United States and actually now around the world. Um, Todd and, and Carrie just presented at the Council of Christian Colleges and Universities President's Meeting, and there were presidents from South Korea, from Kenya, from Zambia, from all sorts of places who are now interested in expanding to those countries as well. So they will participate in the question and answer period near the close of the session. Um, but before that, the presentation will be led by Aaron Epp, a music educator, credentialed music therapist, and an adjunct instructor in Calvin's music department. Since 2017, she has been the director of the Hanlon Tabernacle Choir, so briefly was my director when I, when I performed with them, um, organized collaborative concerts involving Calvin's two campuses, and I think it was last week our gospel choir from this campus was there and performed, well, or practiced together and performed together. Was that, I hope that was filmed, I will be able to see it. Okay, good. Um, and she has mentored student musicians in CPI. Each of the professionals that will be speaking to you today could fill a full introduction with their many credentials, research interests, experience, and areas of impact. But in summary, these are faithful leaders in both thought and action, using their knowledge and gifts to bring transformative education within prison walls. Portions of this session were previously recorded inside the Hanlon Prison Campus, so you would have the privilege of hearing directly from the students. So I look forward to this event. I'm gonna stay for as long as I can, but I'll have to leave early for a meeting. Um, but I just look forward to this, and Aaron, over to you. Thank you, I am so excited to be able to share stories of music in prison with you today. Um, as uh, uh, President Bohr said, you're going to hear the stories directly from the students because we have um, recorded a kind of an interview b between me and them. Um, and so it, I really wanted you to hear firsthand from them um, about the impact that music has had in this environment. So the first thing I'm going to do, though, is tell you a little bit about CPI. Because I know, while I know some of you do know a lot about the program, it's probably new for many of you as well. So the Calvin Prison Initiative, it is a unique program that provides a Christian liberal arts education to inmates at the Richard Hanlon Correctional Facility in Ionia. So that's about 40 minutes from here. It is, uh, it's um, a, a joint uh, uh, initiative between the, the uh, Calvin University and Calvin Seminary. Um, it's the only degree-granting educational program in prison in Michigan. Um, so that's very, uh, very unique. And most of the students in the program have uh, life sentences or very long-term sentences. That's also a unique feature of this program that's uh, unusual for uh, programming to serve um, the life first and, and long-termers. The student body of CPI is very diverse. Diverse in age, diverse in racial and ethnic identity, in class and educational backgrounds, religious and non-religious traditions. Um, we have everybody in CPI, and as you'll see, we have uh, diversity includes diversity in music experiences too, um, which is a great thing. So this, this program is not simply a, a, a program of education where they um, provide courses. Lots of schools do that actually around the country, but this is a program whose vision is to provide education to adult learners in prison by equipping them with the knowledge and skills required to be community leaders. It's not just taking courses, they're being invited into an experience of community, of, um, of, in a learning community. So uh, website there in case anybody wants to check that out later on. Okay, so that is a bit about CPI, and again, we will have time for questions later. If you do have more questions about the actual program, we'll be able to answer those. But I want to tell you a bit about the choir, what we do, how, we, how it started. So the choir is not uh, something they get credit for. It's, it's like an extracurricular activity for the students. 
Um, and they join if they want to, if they're interested. They don't have to do it. Um, it started, let's see, I, I, I began the choir as a regular program in 2017, but it started about a year or two before that, just as a couple of pop-up performances. Patrick will know because he's a charter member of the choir. Uh -huh. And how many students were in the choir when you began? Four. <laughs> okay, four. Of course, the, you know, the program was smaller and not as many students then uh, as well. But we have now over 40 members. And there are, what, just under 100 students in the program? So that's a pretty good percentage. I think better than this campus, you know. <laughs> so um, we meet every week. Uh, in fact, we met this morning. Thursday mornings we meet for two hours. And the, uh, the singers, the, the guys in the choir, they have a range of musical experiences and abilities. Um, the drummer that President Bohr had mentioned, he uh, is professional. He's played Madison Square Garden. He's played with a bunch of, you know, A-list uh, pop stars. Um, but then we have people who have never, ever sung before, ever, and never thought that they would, but found themselves in CPI, found a choir, thought, hey, I think I'd like to try this. I think I'd like to be challenged. Um, you know, so there are a range of motivations, right? Some want to sing, some aren't sure they want to sing, but they like being part of it. And for some, they don't sing for a long time. They lip sync. And they think, I don't know. <laughs> but, but it takes them a while to kind of get comfortable with this idea of breathing and singing next to other people um, and feeling all these different things. So there is quite a range of musical abilities um, and, and prior musical experiences. Many of them actually have learned instruments while incarcerated, which is amazing. So we have um, a guy in the choir who, he's actually the assistant choir director and he plays the keyboards and he's self-taught in prison um, and he's just an incredible musician. So our performances, where do we perform? Um, well, we have CPI events that we perform for. So every time we have a convocation or a graduation or any kind of formal CPI event gathering where we're all together, we will provide music there. Sometimes there will be special events within the prison sponsored by CPI or not, um, things like a Martin Luther King Day event, Hispanic Heritage Month event, those kinds of things, we'll sing there. We will sometimes sing in the uh, church service, one of the church services that is in prison. Um, and the, you know, COVID has interrupted a lot of these gigs, <laughs> actually. We haven't been able to do some of uh, the, the church service because that's been suspended, but hopefully we will again. Then we also have been doing some collaborative events with students from this campus. These are my favorite events to do, I think. Um, so last week we had the gospel choir come out and we sang together. And we sang, and we sang. We have one of the gospel, at least one of the gospel choir members here today. and. Um, it was, it was really, I think, for both campuses, a really transformative thing. So because we are a bunch of people who did not show up at Hanlon to sing primarily, that's not why we're there, we, we have to kind of think about what, what's our purpose? What are we doing? Are we here to learn music, to be technically perfect, as perfect as we can? Are we here to... Um, you know, perform? Are we, what are we here to do? So the model, the way we're thinking about the choir, it's, it's like a church choir or a community choir. It's, yes, we are working on musical skills, techniques, musical learning, certainly. But the goal is really the development of personal and social resources and skills at the same time. The choir really is a place to work out what being in community is like. And anybody who's sung in a choir before, you know you know about the relational processes involved in singing together. We are, it's, a, it's a working out what being commu in community means. So I like to say we at times reflect and represent CPI, the CPI community, who we are, what we do, but we also shape CPI. We also offer possibilities for CPI to, um, to think of themselves as, I guess. So that is us in a bit of what we do. So now I would like to uh, play a song for you that uh, the, it was recorded, and it was played at uh, President Boer's inauguration uh, here on this campus last October. The song is 
um, <clears throat> gospel song called Guide My Feet. So we recorded it, and um, it was played there, and I'd like to play it for you now so you can hear them and see them. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to them now. What we did is we uh, brought some recording equipment uh, into the prison about a month ago, and I interviewed them. I asked them questions about their experiences with music. Five of them, not, not everybody. So four of these five guys are in the choir, um, and another whom you meet, you'll meet, he uh, is not in the choir, but he's a guitarist, musician, and he teaches guitar to other um, inmates there. So all of you had very different musical experiences, very different musical backgrounds before coming to CPI. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could share with us or describe a bit about the role of music for you in CPI and if that's been different than how you engaged with music prior to being a CPI student. CPI choir is like the first like 
uh, time I was like a part of something, a musical uh, choir, and kind of felt accepted. Being a part of the Hand Handling Tabernacle Choir, uh, I, was, I had the opportunity to uh, express my leadership skills. Uh, one, one, one time in particular, we performed this African song, this call and response, uh, uh, Shukadu, Shukadu Yesu. And so I agreed to do it in rehearsal uh, because I thought I would only have to do it in rehearsal, like do the call and had a choir respond. But I didn't know we was planning on doing that song for convocation. And that, you know, signing up to do it in rehearsal, I was signing up to do it in that convocation <laughs> until, like, we got towards convocation and it was like, yeah, okay, Jamie, you're going to, you know, do the call and response. And I was like, wow, how did this happen? So I was really nervous, but I think uh, you work with me, you found my singing range, uh, whereas, you know, it was uh, pleasant. And, uh, yeah, it was very enjoyable. I, I remember being nervous, but I remember also having the confidence of you and having the confidence of the choir. And uh, yeah, I felt like a natural. I felt like, okay, I can do this. So that was that was something I think about all the time and, and uh, I enjoy one of those experiences, so yeah. Having been incarcerated since 1989 at a young age, I was always seeking a way to find my own identity. And music was part of that. Uh, prior to coming, being incarcerated, I was um, a dancer, hip hop dancer. Wow. And um, so that rhythmic, those rhythmic values and, that, and those feelings and ideas that I had, that I was interpreting in dance, that I felt in the music, started to come out through me in music. And um, I got a little keyboard and uh, just started making noises. And so over the time, you know, you meet other people that are doing the same thing. One thing that has been uh, great about the MDOC is that most facilities have a music program mm. and of some sort, some better than others. And, but having that access to a music room where you can go and meet in a group and to, you know, collaborate and just express yourselves was really, for me, a lifesaver in prison. So in 2006, a friend of mine who I was in a jazz band with, he says, hey, I need a keyboard player at service. And um, I was like, ah, well, you know, I don't really do the church thing. You know, thanks for asking. Uh, and he just kept badgering me, badgering me. And finally I said, okay, I'll go. And um, long story shorter, it was um, in, that, in those services that I've felt the presence of community and worshiping God, and, and the, um, reading the scripture started to, you know, uh, come alive in me as well. Those moments were the most fulfilling for me in worship and, and using what God had given me to glorify him and to minister to others. And it, I haven't turned back since, you know, it's been all worship for me. And um, so that's, just a little bit of my experience before CPI. Prior to this program, prior to being entered into CPI, I never would sing. I did not play guitar. Um, I didn't have any aspirations when I first was transferred in here to play music. I was strictly academic minded at that point in time. I had these academic goals. And as soon as I got here, that began to change uh, quickly. When I saw the choir gather here, it sparked my interest. While at first I was a little bit uncomfortable because I've never done that before, being alongside the group, the community of singers, I kind of blended in with everybody and my bad singing got lost in the group and I began to learn more and more. For me, the choir has been a real bridge to others, you know, uh, and communicating not only within choir but outside choir as well. Music just has always been a part of my life, so I've always walked around sung at work, sung in the shower, you know, just everywhere I went I sung. Um, music didn't become important to me until I came to prison. My musical moment started when I started singing for a uh, church service here in prison. And uh, I was up on the stage, I remember I was up on the stage and I was singing and everybody was like, you can sing, you can sing. And I was like, I don't think so. Like I, I was listening to myself, I never really thought I could sing, but everybody else said, 
you could say you need to do something with it. So CPI, the CPI choir, has helped me with a, a lot of techniques that, you know, can make me a better singer. And I kind of like that, the unity to hear us all come together with one voice and, and sing. So uh, that's kind of what CPI is, music and CPI has done for me. Ironically, long before I ever picked up a guitar to play, I started working on them. I had an uncle that was a Lothario. So my first experiences with guitar were, were in fixing them, learning to repair them, putting necks on them, fretboards, and all the stuff that makes an instrument out of it. And then I started learning to play, and I've always had a guitar around somewhere. But as we become adults, we get busy raising families and doing the millions of things we do, and, we, and that fades away. You have other responsibilities. I didn't pick the guitar back up earnestly until I got here as a level two in, in 2006. And I picked it up and, rem and, and remembered how much I forgot and started working on it, formed bands. Um, through the chaplain's office, I started teaching guitar. We had a residential treatment program here. We started teaching some of the people that were challenged and it clicked and it just fit. I had a way with a way with 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 building a system to teach that. <clears throat> About the time Calvin came, we started a guitar program, a beginner's guitar program, and a lot of Calvin guys were really really interested in it. We ended up with a lot of Calvin students in the first guitar program, and they say that they say that the real proof of your labor is the fruit. And there are a couple of guys here today that are playing guitar because they started in the beginning guitar program. So I work with guys with music all the time, play a little here and there where we can in the church services, and can't imagine what life would be without it. It's a basis for tons of communication. How much communication have we had because of music? That's interesting, and it, it um, reminds me of something that a lot of students have told me. Um, anecdotally, either in conversations or uh, through written assignments in the Music 103 class, for example. And th that is, they, they speak about, write about music changing a space, transforming a space. You know, there are many spaces in prison, right, that are used for different things. And you put music into a space and suddenly that space could be used for different things. There's uh, not simply a physical space, but a, an interpersonal space that changes and an interactional space that changes. Can you guys speak to that? I mean, you began to when you talked about how music has um, opened up communication in, in, in ways, but how, how is music changing spaces between people? Music has always been a part of the prison experience. Sometimes, and what is a, a blessing, I would say, about this facility is that we have so many instruments, partly because of the guitar program that uh, Lyle mentioned, um, when he started that program, suddenly there were like 25 to 30 guitars. And so what, what that did is it put um, live music into these spaces. Mm -hmm. um, because of uh, CPI, a lot of that music was worship music. We worshiped uh, three times a day on the small yard in D unit. And we would just be out there with that keyboard over there and just singing and doing worship songs. And people would come around just to sit around. Now we could sit there and, 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 and talk about God and, and you know, people would, yeah, <coughs> might walk by. But when they hear us singing praises, so the phone was nearby where we would always set up and, and someone was like, yeah, I was on the phone and we heard that song, Hallelujah, and can you play it again? And they heard it on, and so it, music just, uh, it cuts through the, the muck and mire of difference, and it crosses that difference and, and makes a bond with people that otherwise wouldn't have, have been made. Uh, surprisingly, I haven't had much resistance from people sitting around me, um, which is surprising because I'm, the the, I'm the least experienced musician here. I'm, I'm the worst performer by far. You got to get another crowd. You're pretty good, man. So, <laughs> But it has been very pleasant for me, and I've noticed at times when I've brought the guitar from the guitar program that Lyle put together, when I would bring it out on the yard, 
and start practicing songs, somebody would always pull up alongside of me. And early on, when I was first really trying to learn the basics of playing rhythm, it was annoying for me. They loved it because I'm trying to get practice in, you know, and they want to come and they want to talk and they want to play. And they even sometimes guys even want to sing alongside of you. So that was actually pleasant for those around me. And it was good for me too. But I, I noticed it transitioned, that space transitioned into the cell as well. So during COVID here, we kept getting mixed up with all different bunkies. Prison was moving us around uh, often, sometimes weekly. And I kept getting new bunkies. So I would ask them, I'd say, hey, you know, I play guitar and sing. Do you mind if I play quietly in the cell here? And almost all of them said, yeah, I don't mind. And I told them, I said, all I know is mainly Christian songs. I, I told myself, because God, God blessed me with this program to come here and grow and learn. I said, I want to play Christian songs first and learn those before I start really getting into playing rock and stuff like that that I also like. So I would tell these guys, my bunkies, that that's all I know is mainly Christian songs. And they would say, that's all right. And surprisingly, a couple guys who weren't even Christians would join in with me and we would play some songs and sing some songs in the cell. And for me, that, that was key. You know, that was a big moment in here. I could go right now on any yard here, Deering Yard, in the cold, sit down with my guitar, turn the amp around, and within five minutes, the table would be full of people. It opens doors. It gives you the opportunity to communi communicate with people that, that you don't talk to, people that walk the other side of the hallway all the time. I, 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 tell, I, I say that everybody in here has walls. And music is the one thing that breaks those down. If a guy doesn't want to listen, doesn't want to be a part, he doesn't have to. He goes to a different table. But if I go out to sit and play by myself, if I walk outside with my guitar, I know I'm not going to be by myself. Within just a few minutes, somebody's going to sit down, and then there will be two or three more show up, show up quickly. It, it opens doors. It gives you an opportunity to learn new faces, to learn new names to help people get some, you may have just interfered with somebody who was thinking about suicide 10 minutes before and now he's lost in a ZZ Top song having the time of his life. True. Tapping a foot and talking to people that he didn't talk to before and, he's get, and, and he lost all ideas of the notion that he had. It changes things, it changes the atmosphere and that's what I love so much about music is, is no one has to agree, it just does it all by itself. And different music has like different energy. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about uh, introducing music into a space. Like we have the activity rooms over there, which is kind of similar to this. And so if I walk into an activity room and you have like some music that's talking about killing people, that's talking about violence, promoting violence, that really doesn't seem like a safe space. The, the energy in that, in that space seems kind of off because the people that's listening to it, they kind of promoting it a little bit. But on the flip side, you walk into that same day room and somebody's playing like a happy song, somebody's playing like, you know, a gospel song or Britney the Spears. Beatles, uh, Britney Spears. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that space seems a little bit more safer. It seems a little bit more inviting. You know, so it, it, it might make a person like, you know, really think about what they're doing. Like if, if I got plans to go over here and gamble and you come in singing hallelujah, that may make me think, man, should I be in here gambling? True. And so, you know, the music, you know, creates a different energy and that energy defines the space. Yeah. Jamie, I wonder if you can speak a bit about the process of creating the Alma Mater 2.0, how that came about. Yeah. You were involved as well, yeah. musically, you, um, lyrically. Um, rapidly, if that's a word, <laughs> and, and can, you, can you tell us how that came about from, from inception to where we are now with it? So being a part of the, the Hanlon Tamalek Choir, we, we like to experiment, we like to, you know, do new things, you know, sing new songs and stuff like that, and so we had sung the, the alma mater at the previous convocations and that became a regular thing, and somebody asked me to write a rap. Uh, to the Calvin alma mater. And I was, I hadn't wrote a rap in a long time, so I didn't feel complete, completely comfortable doing it, but I'm the type of guy, if you ask me to do something, I'm, I'm gonna give my best. So, sat down, wrote the rap. 
I remember the first time I performed in front of the, the choir, you know, I, I didn't know what type of response I was going to get. I didn't expect to get a good response. And when I did the rap and the choir all accepted it and enjoyed it, I was like, wow, you know, that was easy. <laughs> I, I, I didn't expect it to go off so, so easy. So, yeah, it was, uh, it wasn't hard. It wasn't difficult. I just basically took all the things that I heard, uh, uh, that was connected to CPI, that was connected to Calvin University, uh, many things that Professor uh, Dr. Chaffee talked about, about the program and what it was about. Think deeply, act justly, and live wholeheartedly as Christ agents of renewal. So I took all those things that I had learned about Calvin University and I incorporated it into a rap along with what was already said in the Calvin alma mater. And yeah, it, it, it turned out to be something that a lot of people liked and I'm still shocked by it. I'm still amazed that so many people embrace it and so many people en enjoy it and, and so many people look forward to us performing it, so yeah. yeah. I remember the first time I heard Jamie do it and my thought was, okay, Noel Crest, welcome, welcome to Hanlon. <laughs> you know, because we, we, we've always been a satellite campus. We are a part of the Calvin University campus. And, and, and you have all the professor and, and, and the hierarchy and everything of a university and the sacred. And that's one level of intensity. But here comes Hanlon. Here's our intensity. And we're going to give it right back. We're, we're here. This is our sound. And I like that. I, I thought it. I thought it was. It, it. It. It set a footprint. It established our path. Set our trend. I like that. We're talking about songwriting here, and I know most of you have written songs. Have you, Lyle? Okay. Dozens. <laughs> okay. Dozens. So all of you are composers, <laughs> songwriters. What, what's that been like since you've been in CPI? And what kind of songwriting have you been doing? Um. I wrote my first song ever is a, a love song uh, talking about the fences that stand between me and a, a loved one. And that was a big deal for me, not only writing the song, I, I wrote it during the height of COVID when we weren't in school and the weight of COVID was really pushing down on all of us. And it just, it came together quickly. I never thought my first song would. My second song, it, it took me 10 times as long put together as my first. And, I think that's what happens when the spirit hits you in that respect. And a, another key moment in relation to that song is when I performed it for a class here. Uh, for me, that was a big deal because that's the first time I ever got up in front of an audience and did an original, you know. And I didn't think it would connect with my audience, you know, because it's my song and it's mostly a love song about between me and someone else. And when I was performing it, I was seeing some guys that had like glossed over eyes and I was thinking well it's allergy season you know <laughs> and I didn't think I would ever connect with someone on that level two guys came to me later that day and said you know you made me cry and I was, I was blown away you know I, I couldn't believe that something so simple from someone who's not experienced could reach out and touch that audience like that and to have those guys come to me later and uh, say that to me was a, a key moment for me yeah. yeah. I've noticed that uh, a lot of the songs that I write are about prison. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I just, I looked at some of the, most of the songs that I've written, I've written probably about like 30 songs now, and I, I looked at the pattern and I said, man, these songs are about time and, you know, about missing, missing loved ones and just pain. And so I kind of forced myself to start trying to write about other things and uh, yeah, that's just something that I noticed about songwriting since I've been in prison. I encourage it all the time. <clears throat> the whole point about I do when even in the guitar class, I'm telling them, think all the time. You know, put what you can put to it. You know, I think the first song I wrote was called Standing on Broken Promises. And, and it was all about that moment in that time. I've written hundreds since then but it's but it, it, it's funny how the song you write always reflects the moment that moment in this place 
you know, whether it's whether you're you're in worship, whether you're writing a writing, remaking a song, it's about the energy that you have and the feeling of that moment. And then you can look back at that song, and say, "Oh, I remember that." And start playing it back, and you're thinking, "Wow, the place I was in then, man, I was really hurt, or I was really lonely, or, or, or what was that day like?" Songwriting for me in CPI has changed in the sense that I've uh, become a person who has helped others, who's been a facilitator of creativity. And so it hasn't only, you know, in the past I would just write by myself. Um, occasionally I would uh, collaborate with someone spontaneously who was another artist, but mostly write by myself. Since entering in CPI, I've written songs with other people. Learn to Reconcile, uh, which was a, a song written by choir members. Great song. And uh, was featured in Dialogue. And, uh, you know, other songs as well. The song that we're going to perform a song um, today um, called How Do You Worship? And, uh, you know, I helped uh, facilitate that with, uh, co write that with Chris and, and Hank. And so it's been about that connection with people. It's all about the relationships now. It's all about developing and building relationships with the people you're collaborating with, but also letting that reflect in what we're writing and then reach others and touch others as well. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy about writing raps when I did that a lot earlier in my incarceration was the company that it put me in. It, it put me around some very talented guys who who had the, the talent to really be, you know, rap stars and to be able to like experience rapping with these guys and to like hear them rap and then for them to hear me rap and for them to like, oh man, that's good, I like that. I like, and be impressed by some bars that I put together. And that was just something that I really enjoyed as a, as a songwriter. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. This might be a good time to um, hear the song that you wrote. So, um, yeah. If you want to just say a few words to introduce it? I would, yeah, originally I wanted to do a solo performance and then Dave came to me and Hank came to me and we talked about doing a collaboration. Yeah. So yeah, this is my first collaboration I've ever done um, and it, it wrote itself fast, much faster than I ever thought it would. And I was really intimidated to collaborate with two guys who have their kind of experience, you know. And it just the spirit touched me on this and my lyrics came to me quickly, and it worked, and I, I love the song, and I hope it's something that is special to others as well. How do you worship the Lord? How do you worship the Savior? Serving one 
like to perform for other people. We've performed, we don't, you know, we have a limited number of gigs we can get, but we've performed at convocations, at um, graduation, also other things that come up, um, you know, in, in the rhythm of life here. So what, what's it like to perform for other people? I think it's amazing. Uh, I think uh, in doing so, I'm kind of reliving like a lost dream. Like when I was in the world, I had this dream of being a rapper. Uh, coming to prison kind of snuffed that dream out. But it didn't stop me from being able to perform in front of other people. From uh, reciting poetry at, at different places to being in a choir, singing a song in a choir to, you know, doing a rap performance. And so I guess in a nutshell, uh, performing for me is giving, some, giving people something. When I'm doing praise and worship, there, is no, there are no nerves whatsoever. Um, however, when we perform for an event like commencement or some other event, there are some nerves there. Um, partly because, you know, you feel like this is um, um, the one time that people are going to have an opportunity to hear you, particularly from our perspective, um, you know, being incarcerated, you never know when the next time you're going to have, or when they're going to take away something, or, or um, things just aren't as constant or permanent, if you will, because of the institutional setting. And so you wonder, you know, this might be the only time, you know, Lyle, who I've never met, will hear me. And, you know, this is an opportunity for him to accept me in some ways, you know, by, you know, me uh, performing well and him accepting my performance. Uh, whereas when it, when it comes to uh, worship and service, we're all there together. That's the way I view it. You know, we're there together singing to the Lord or singing about God mm -hmm. and um, ministering to each other. For me... The, the most important part is the reward, not the reward for myself, but the reward for the congregation. So I get up twice a week, at least twice a week, and perform songs for the services alongside of Hank and some other guys here too as well. And it's when we make that connection with our audience which is most important to me. It's not about the performance, it's about our connection with the congregation. What happens with me is uh, when I enter into the singing, I'm nervous, and then throughout the singing, as I look at everybody enjoying the music, like you said, it's about the congregation or it's about the audience that is listening, then I see how they're enjoying it, and then I kind of calm down a little bit more. Yep. But I always have butterflies in my stomach. I'm always nervous. Hank, what's your favorite uh, memory of performing, or what was your favorite performance? Wow, I, w I would have to say that, uh, I don't know if you guys remember Tree Sacks, obviously. We had his memorial service here in the auditorium. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had I wrote a song, and Tree Sacks, he was one of the first ones to hear it in the hallway. I said, I wrote a song, man, you wanna hear it? And uh, he was like, yeah, let me hear it. So I played it for him, and he was like, man, that's a, I love that song. So every time he saw me, he asked me to play that song. And that was one of the best performances when he passed away at his memorial service. I did that for him because, you know, he, he loved that song. And for me to be able to do that, that was like one of the best experiences ever. It just, it just meant everything that music is about. You know what I mean? It's about bringing that, that type of feeling. There was not a dry eye in the audience that day. Yeah, no, it was. Yeah. <clears throat> it was good. 
Being in CPI is a new experience of community for many of you, and it's a way to learn how to be in community and, and live with others. That way, how has music figured into that for you? How, how has music helped you to understand what it means to be in community? We lived right across the hall from each other for years. Mm -hmm. and, and, and people wandering up and down the hallways playing guitar and, and, and singing back and forth and in and out of the day rooms. And music was, you know, it builds a fabric. It, it, it really becomes part of the fabric that, that you build. And when you're with a cohort, with other cohorts around it, it's like rings of community that you touch and you reach the whole time. I watched you guys all the time in the day rooms and back and forth and playing, and it was a constant interaction, just yeah. continuous. I don't think it ever stopped. Just, yeah. As CPI, we, we act as a community already. That's like the motto. And it brings in people from outside of CPI as well, just to see us in there playing music. Music has that uh, attractive kind of feel to it. It just brings people over. You, you cannot sit in the day room with your guitar and play some music without somebody coming over saying, who wrote that? Or can you play this? Can you play that? So I think that it even brings outside of uh, Calvin, outside of CPI, it brings the community uh, in the prison system as well yeah. yep. together. I so, don't know if you guys experienced that. Well. Yeah, oh yes, yeah. yes. For me, um, music and community, it, 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 it's therapy. And it's not only therapy for others, but for especially for me. And what I mean by that is if, if I'm depressed, I might say to someone, hey, let's play a song together. You know, you want to play guitar, you want to sing a song. And when we do that, afterwards, I just feel on top of the world. I, I feel energized. I'm thinking more clearly. I'm happier. And it just brings a spice of life to me that I didn't have before prior to learning to sing or play guitar. Prior to being involved in this program in choir, I was highly introverted and I didn't talk to people much. I kept my distance. I was very untrustworthy of anybody, wouldn't get near anyone. And through music, I opened up my vulnerable side. You know, I, th th by being vulnerable, I, I learned to have better communication. It's like I learned a different language. Also, when we work with each other, we have to leave space for each other. We have to be mindful. Um, I, I know I feel it quite a bit because I can easily overwhelm someone who isn't as experienced with music by saying, let's do this and do that, or you know, challenging and move quickly be past what their ability might be. But what I've learned is that it's better if I just hold that back. I don't need to um, push, push people further than what they need to be. The important part is that you get what you need to get out of that moment. There'll be another song that we can write or that other songs will be written, but that song will be what, it, what it, it's meant to be at that time. It doesn't have to be the most, my opus, magnum opus, yeah. you know, in collaboration. It just has to be what it was meant to be for that moment. And for this, particularly the song that we did today, that moment was just us sharing and, and growing together yeah. and, and just expressing this desire and this, this blessing that we get to worship God. We don't have to, we get to. And um, you know, to express that in song and to, to come together and, and also what we do is we, we give an example to others in these spaces. We're going to have to end here soon, but I just want to ask if there are any stories that you have that you haven't shared yet, stories of favorite moments in music. I took your choir sheet <clears throat> from this last performance. I took your song sheet and a couple of guys from the choir and an F unit. We put together sign-up sheets and had, and had a, had a day room full of the residential people down there singing carols twice a day through the entire holiday season and those songs brought more joy to more people in just simple acapella and, and a little guitar here and there but in simple acapella singing of, of carols 
You know, it, it was just it was just wonderful. It was it was amazing to sit back when it was all done. I've still got guys walking around and they're singing Christmas carols. You know, they just and for for something they thought, well, we don't think that'll work very well. It was an amazing experience, and the transformation on the guys when they were doing it was just wonderful. Yeah, we we perform uh, Christmas carols uh, a couple of years ago when we did the play. Yeah. <clears throat> And I remember uh, afterwards, this wasn't for Celebration Fellowship, this just was for, for a small number of people who signed up to come over and watch us do a play and watch us do the, do the Christmas carols. And I remember looking in the audience and seeing some of the prisoners that I knew like kind of struggled with drug addiction that kind of be off into like a lot of other stuff. And I saw them like kind of enjoying the Christmas carols, right? And I kind of created this the story in my mind that they were kind of re like reliving their youth. They were reliving a time where they wasn't on drugs, when they wasn't in prison, and they wasn't struggling with whatever they were struggling with. This is, this is what I saw in these men who were in the audience. And uh, I think I kind of, from that experience, I kind of got an understanding of what it was all about. Like, I kind of got an understanding of like what we do as a choir. And I think I, I spoke to you about this because I see preachers come in here uh, and will preach to 15 people and not be mad. Like, they're they not mad that an that a auditorium that holds 200 people only have 15 people. They will preach to 15 people as if it's 200 people. And so I kind of felt like we did the same thing. We sung to 20 people as if it was 200 people, and they enjoyed it. And so we, we were not angry that we didn't have a packed house I know, I know myself, I was satisfied with the people that came because, again, I kind of felt like they got a chance to separate themselves from whatever was going on in their life for, for 30 minutes. And I thought that was, like, really, really big. So, yeah. so for me, a, a big moment for us as a program, as a whole, as a community, was the graduation ceremony, which was live streamed, uh, where... We all, you know, gathered on stage, the choir, and, and sang in front of live cameras, you know. And I, it built a bridge not only to my family, but to the community as well. All of us in here have taken something from society, and not in a good way. So it's nice to be able to finally give back to society in a good way. And uh, when, when we did that event, I, and I called home, and I called the people who watched it, it was just nothing but praise and, and good things to say. And for me, that was a really big moment, you know, to, to see the fruits of our labor as a group reach a larger group, a collective community out there in the free world, you know, was, it was just so powerful, you know. Thank you, everybody. I have spent, you know, almost five years now with you in music, most of you, not all of you. Um, and it's great to hear some of your thoughts. I've learned some new things from you. Um, and. Thank you again. This has been um, wonderful to hear from you. So the last video is a recording of the Calvin Alma Mater, and they referred to it uh, in, in, in the interview. So the, the original Calvin Alma Mater is an anthem to Calvin, you know, and um, it's sung at or performed at, when is it, Com uh, Convocation. Right, that's when it happens, convocation usually. And um, we sang it. And after a while they said, you know, we have some ideas. It wasn't really their jam. So they, uh, we call it now the alma mater 2.0. So Jamie here, he wrote a rap and we'd like to play that. That's on the next slide if that's possible. Yes, okay. So we play, we, we begin with the original um, anthem and then it goes into the, the new version.
living with our whole heart is a must. Calvin Heights, invest in life. We never rest best school in the Midwest. On our resume, in the recipe, Christ ages a renewal in society. To maroon and gold, we pledge fidelity. A cool with tools that will teach students how to lead and how to think critically. Serve the world through the lenses of the CRC and how to live purposely. Transparency, accountability, unity, community. So you know we went to Calvin University. Creativity in that group, so much creativity. So we are past time. I know there were a few more questions. I think we should probably get out of here around 4.15ish to make room for the next group coming in. But if there are further questions, I wonder if Carrie and Todd, you wanna join me up here um, just so that you have opportunity to ask anything. Thank you so much for, for coming today. Uh, any other colleges had reached out uh, after seeing some of the success of that program to see if they could implement something like that or if other church groups or any sort of things to broaden that? Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> we started this program officially June 1 of 2015. We had been offering non-accredited, no-credit-bearing courses since 2011. So we've been at this a little over a decade at the same prison and as uh, our official program started, it uh, was getting the attention of folks, including universities and colleges in Michigan. And so we started getting phone calls about, hey, we've heard about your program, we're thinking about a program, can you help? Uh, one of the colleges that did this was Hope College. So if you know anything about Hope College, Calvin College, we got a big kick out of this. Um, <clears throat> Hope was reaching out, and so we actually spent several years working with them to get a program up and running, and Hope College Western Seminary, they modeled now their program after ours, and they're very, it's a very similar program. And so their goal, too, is to raise up leaders in prison so that they can help transform prisons. Also since starting, now we run a consortium uh, here in Michigan, and we have 14 colleges and universities <clears throat> in our consortium, and it consists of both private schools, state schools, religious schools, non-religious schools. And so we <clears throat> are anticipating that in the next 10 years, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, there will be substantial higher ed programs uh, in Michigan's prison. And the goal, we see it as why not, let's have a higher ed program in every prison in Michigan. And then our hope is that along with that comes all the extracurricular activities, which as you now saw, becomes incredibly important and meaningful for these guys. Um, I have a question about repertoire. Um, you mentioned that the choir is very diverse, and so I'm curious to know, like, does the repertoire reflect that diversity, or are some genres maybe more accessible than others, or how do you make those decisions? Yeah, that's a very good question. Very, very good. <sighs> It's not easy picking repertoire. Um, never is, right, for any choir. But yes, it's definitely a balance of things they can feel successful with very quickly and ch things that are more challenging and they can work towards. Also a balance between different musical cultures and different musical styles. Um, Yes, I try, and I, you know, now that David, who you saw as a choir assistant, he helps a lot with choosing music because he knows what will work in the group, not just what he likes, what he, but what's going to work for 
everybody, you know, and what's going to be accepted by everybody. So there, a lot of thought goes into kind of meeting their um, interests, meeting their needs, um, but also in a way that kind of, you know, expands their horizons and expands their assumptions about certain kinds of music. So that, you know, and that, that's another difficult social piece of it, right? Can you sing the music of, you know, can you sing this music that you don't like because your neighbor likes it? Or can you sing music that you thought you didn't like uh, because you associated it with a certain kind of person? Um, yeah, so that, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. And I think, One. oh. <laughs> Please, okay. yeah, last Go one. ahead, go ahead, oh, sorry. sorry, last question. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, um, as somebody who's studying music right now in undergrad, um, I know that it's had a big impact on me and being able to take classes, not just choirs, but also like music history courses and music theory and things like that. Um, is that offered there and would it be in the future if it's not now? In, in the program, you, you, yes. So they take a course, an introduction to music called Music 103. It's an understanding and enjoying music. It's a class I teach. Um, so they have that advanced courses, theory, history, um, or more in-depth history. No, not at this point. I mean, those kinds of courses are usually taken by music students and we don't have um, a music major at this point. I mean, there's one one major. Maybe we didn't talk about that, just the... Yeah, there, the, the, there's that. one major, it's called Faith and Community Leadership. Yeah. Okay. It's liberal arts based. So they do take an introduction to music class, but um, nothing beyond that. There are some who would really benefit from music theory and they ask a lot, um, but so far it hasn't worked worked out for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said there are a lot of instruments. In some ways, that's true. It's, it, there's not a lot of access, though, to the instruments. Because they're there doesn't mean that just anybody can play them. They, uh, anything that comes in, um, certainly, I mean, CPIO owns a few instruments, not many, that we've had to receive approval for, and they've been thoroughly inspected, and they have to be stored in a particular spot. The, the instruments the prison has, um, you know, would, would be, they would have had their own ways of inspecting them, yeah. approving them, yeah. Um, it used to be the case that uh, an inmate could have like a small keyboard in the cell, and then that would have to be provided from an outside source. Uh, and then <clears throat> each facility, each prison, of course, has its own culture, and even though policies may be in place, it, they can bend those policies a bit. And so in our case, we actually have a band that is now the band for the choir, and they have full drum set, guitars, bass, the whole bit. And they do have access uh, at least once a week to go practice as a band. And so they've been pretty free about allowing them uh, to gain that access in an auditorium setting. <clears throat> but they do restrict, and um, at times, they will even use it uh, as a form of punishment. So if they think there's a problem, uh, they'll simply say, well, we're just not going to allow you to have any instruments for X amount of time. Uh, it's strange punishment in my mind, <clears throat> but they will use that uh, at times. So I have a very brief testimony and then kind of a question that arises out of that. About a year ago, our church played uh, the recording on YouTube of Amazing Grace that had been sung. Um, probably one of the most memorable experiences of worship that our church has ever had. What folks told me afterward was that it transformed the way they thought about those incarcerated folks in particular, 
thinking of them no longer primarily as incarcerated, but primarily as brothers in Christ. Um, I'm wondering if you've thought a little bit about the transformative power of music as it gets shared uh, beyond the Hanlon walls. Yeah, I mean, that that's it right there, right? I, they are presented in a way where their first identity is not incarcerated person. It is brothers in Christ. It is musician. It is team member. It is a whole a community member. I mean, it's a whole lot of other things. I hope we get to see it because they do. I ask them what performing is like for them, and many of them talk about it. This is an opportunity for me to offer something, yes. right? I can give something. Nobody ever looks at me as somebody who has something to give. And certainly, in, you know, in, in Christian community, that that's. Well, that, that's the pattern of relationship, right? It's this mutual giving and receiving, this reciprocal flow. And to be excluded from any kind of opportunity to give, to be excluded from any kind of, um, yeah, reciprocal exchange is, is devastating. What they love is to be able to give something and to be recognized as somebody who has something to give. Yeah, the way it cha can change their identity um, I think that you've, you've really hit, hit it right on. Do you have anything to add? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I do. Uh, so I, I'll speak a little bit to the, the choir setting that you're talking about, but I want to say more general things about prison. So uh, a church choir is often uh, singing in a liturgical setting. And if we think about the movement of liturgy, uh, we do on occasion, if not on a regular occasion, we have sacramental movement. So here's what I uh, always challenge people with. Not only are these people creating the image of God, not only are they singing uh, Amazing Grace or whatever, but many of these men are baptized. And we have an obligation as Christians to treat those who are baptized a certain way. And so one thing that I think efforts like this choir do, it's actually subversive. Okay, it's subversive. Because in choir, you're not known by a prison number. Uh, the, the, the culture in our prison is often when they refer to a prisoner, they'll say, Prisoner Jones. And I always try to look for a way to basically say, that's not a name. It's David Jones. Yes. Or they'll ask, what is David Jones' number? And I'll say, I don't know. Why would I care about a prison number? I'm talking about a baptized brother. And so it seems to me that um, not only is it subversive in the prison, but I think it can be that way for our churches. Because unfortunately, so many of our churches have bought into a view of prisoners that is not only inaccurate, but it violates our baptism. Yes. Yes. And so it seems to me that we have a calling to repent <laughs> and then to change that uh, mentality and approach. I want to ask one of the online questions um, from the live stream. Kathleen asks, are there more graduates from the program that have gone on to work with music in other settings or on the main campus? I'd be curious about the ongoing influence and impact of the program. So of the, of the choir members that have that are now in the community, I'm just trying to think of, so, I mean, I, I can't think necessarily of specific, you know, ensembles they've been part of. Usually when they get to their classes here, they're so overwhelmed with everything. They don't have a lot of time with extra for extracurriculars, right? I mean, I know that music is, continues to be a part of their life. I think of Mark, I think of Solo, right? Who does a lot of music. Patrick, maybe you have something to add there. Yeah, yeah. But I, I continue to a journey of uh, singing on music here, just trying to be a present for those who are not out here. I just continue that walk of singing wherever I am, just trying to show that God is still sovereign in my life and hoping that, that to see Him on the same journey with I am. Yeah. 
And I think one of our goals uh, in the program is to eventually send out students and teams to mimic uh, what they, we have started at the prison where our program is. And so uh, it would be a great thing if we could mimic choirs and so forth. Uh, you should also know, if you don't know, that at the Handlin Prison, there is a CRC church plant. So it's a real church plant. It's not a program. It's not a chaplaincy thing. It's a church plant with a pastor. And two of our CPI students have been very active in that church and were being discipled and mentored to become church planters. And so uh, our vision is that we will send out Calvin grads, uh, as called, to plant churches, and I can't imagine uh, not having a choir with those churches. How do you do church without a choir? So uh, we're getting there, uh, but that absolutely is a vision for a, precisely these reasons uh, that we've been talking about. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for opening up for Q&A. My question uh, centers around like a biblical hermeneutic that we might derive from this. Um, you know, clearly these, you know, individuals have had life-changing experiences and um, their view of scripture um, probably lends, there's probably a lot for us to take away from um, and implement within our, you know, within churches that are not within this context. Um, is there been, has there been any um, kind of, I know this seems to be, is this a new project, a new initiative? Um, and if so, is there, is there like an exploration? Are there plans to explore that more? Um, because I think it could be valuable, for instance, in my church context to yes. uh, maybe explore those things. Great. When you said biblical hermeneutic, my eyes glazed over. So you take that. Yeah. <laughs> so Aaron and I are married. That, that's why I said, when he she's said biblical you, hermeneutic, my eyes theologian. closed over so he can, he can take I'm theologian. That. She heard biblical hermeneutic and kind of <laughs> crashed like the laptop. <laughs> um, of course, I came alive, so, <laughs> so let me uh, respond uh, to my love language. <clears throat> um, yeah, there, there, there is an active biblical hermeneutic there. Um, they actually take very seriously uh, what Matthew 25 says, that when you visit the prisoner, you meet Jesus. They take that very seriously. And they've taught us that it is serious. And so I would put it this way, that um, they know their scripture well, but they are more eager to practice it. Now that sounds obvious, but I've been a pastor that's not always the case in a lot of our churches. We become very satisfied with uh, belief and not with praxis. Everything in that prison setting matters what you do every minute of the day. How you carry yourself, where you sit, is your back towards the door or not. They're aware of every act. And so this is why just the fact of joining a choir becomes a significant act. Whereas on the outside, of course, we take that for granted quite often. So I, I think the biblical hermeneutic for them would be uh, that they really want to see what scripture looks like lived. It really very much is a lived theology. Uh, and so that's why I, I just think uh, they're eager for more than what an academic classroom can provide. And so the choir is a very tangible activity that uh, they see as a natural outcome of what they're actually being taught in the classroom. And so I, I think if, if we were to teach courses and we wouldn't always have the same books or textbooks, they would get over it and they would figure it out. But if we said the choir is going away, I think this would be devastating. I, I, I think they would almost refuse it. See? This is why when the facility, the prison at times, they use 
these opportunities for discipline, they'll like take the choir away. It, it's cutting them down at their knees, you know? Mm -hmm. I was just gonna add, it, you know, music is an action. It's not a thing, it's an action. What they're doing is they're resourcing music, right? They are using the materials, resourcing the materials of music and using it to figure out how to live together. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna have to clear out. Thank you for being here.